Welcome to Inspires. I'm PJ, this is Matt. Hey. We're both professors here in the College of Engineering at UAH. We teach senior design. So we have seniors in engineering that develop conceptual design spacecraft for future NASA planetary science missions. So what we're going to do with you this semester is you guys are going to work with us, Matt, me, the college kids, and we're going to help you design a scientific payload that could be put on one of these UAH uh, spacecraft. So we're going to work with you all semester. You're going to see us every week, and that's going to be the fun part, we hope. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to tell you about this project and tell you what this challenge is all about. Okay, we're going to tell you a little bit about INSPIRES now. Matt, what does INSPIRES stand for? INSPIRES is the innovative system project for the increased recruitment of emerging STEM students. See, you too can become an acronym geek just like us. Yeah. Over this semester, you're going to create lots of acronyms just like we do, and NASA would love it. It's so a lot of work. Just get ready. Mm -hmm. Okay. So INSPIRES is a challenge. What we're going to do is you are competing against other high schools in North Alabama. And so what you've got to do is develop and design an autonomous scientific payload for a NASA planetary science mission. So what do we mean by autonomous? We mean you must get away. You must leave us and get away from us. Just like right now, you're in high school. But eventually, your parents, are, when you graduate, are going to go get out. And so that's what we're going to do with you, too. We're going to take you there to the planet or wherever you want to go, and then we're going to say, get away. Go away and do what you need to do, okay? We're going to kick you off. So that is the autonomous part of it. So what does it mean to develop a science payload? So what we're going to do with you is you're first going to have to figure out what's the purpose of your payload. That's a big deal in engineering right now. You can no longer, used to be in engineering that we could sit down and say, look at my pretty widget, look what I did. And everybody would go, oh, look at the pretty widget, but what's it for? And everybody would go, I don't know, I just made a pretty widget. But we're not going to do that anymore. That's not the way engineering works. And so what your first job is, is you've got to figure out what do you want to do and where. Okay, this semester we're going to Ganymede, just a preview. We're going to Ganymede, one of Jupiter's moons, the largest moon in the solar system. But we gotta go by a planet named Venus. We gotta go by a planet named Jupiter. We gotta go by some moons on the way there. So you could say, hey, throw me off at Venus. I'm gonna do blah, 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 okay? So that's your job. Your first job is to figure out what I wanna do and where I wanna do it. And it's your job. It's your mission. It's not ours. We'll help you and we'll give you some ideas Matt and I have cooked up some stuff for you to think about, but that's it. The rest is up to you. You need to figure out where you want to go, okay? The second thing we're going to do with you is you're going to understand a little bit about the engineering design process. Matt and I, <laughs> Havana now, teaches, Matt and I teach uh, engineering design every semester, every year here at UAH. So we're pretty familiar with it, but we realize you're not. So what we're going to do is we're going to come see you weekly. Yes, I said it right, weekly to you and talk to you a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more about engineering design and how you create this thing so we'll work with you on that you're going to learn how to create alternatives you're going to learn how to pick things you're going to do all that stuff with us over this wonderful semester okay last thing you're going to do with us is you're going to start to understand what we call the soft skills okay the soft skills teamwork you're all going to have to learn how to work together in a team there's going to be several teams maybe in your in your class and so you're going to have to learn how to work together Engineers and scientists traditionally don't like to do this. We don't like each other. Like, I don't like Matt at all. Not at all. Yep. So, we hate each other. Yep, exactly. So, we're going to work with you, and you're going to have to work with other people on your team. You're going to have to learn how to trust each other. Big thing we don't do. I don't trust him at all. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Nope. <clears throat> Next thing you're going to do is present, right? You've got to learn how to, te to tell an audience your idea. You could have the greatest idea in the world. But if you cannot communicate it to the world, it's not going to go anywhere, much like Matt. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do with you is you're going to present to us, to people from UAH, to industry, and ultimately to NASA. So if you don't like presenting, get over it, because this semester you're going to do some of it. And you're going to have to do it, and that's part of the competition. The last thing you're going to have to do is write. And I know for several of you sitting out there right now, you have to realize that maybe your English teacher is right. And I hate to admit it because I did not like English in high school either, no, it but it had to be right. So it turns out they are actually the right ones. They're the ones who tell us to write and we have to do it. So you're going to write for us, but you're not going to write that, oh, flowery stuff. What you're going to do is write the boring technical stuff. That's what engineers do. 
We write boring technical reports for people and they never read them. But you're going to write something for us. One thing's four pages, one thing's five pages, not a lot, but we're going to read it. So you got to make sure and do it correctly. So we need to do that. So you might be saying, you're sitting in this classroom, physics or engineering, and go, I'm not going to really be an engineer. I don't care about this. Oh, ho, ho. No matter what you want to be, chef, marketing, business, I don't know, whatever. Wedding planner. Wedding planner, yeah, whatever, whatever. there is. <laughs> this last one, these soft skills, you're all going to have to do it. You all have to talk to people. That's the way the world works. You usually have to talk to people that are not in this time zone with us and maybe not on this in this country. So you've got to be able to handle that. So no matter what, that's going to be very important to you. Okay? What you're going to find is, is that uh, most of the problems are not technical problems. There are no technical problems anymore. You guys can figure it out. The communication is the hard part. So we're going to work on that the entire semester. So. We're going to give you what's called an interface control document. It's actually in your notebook that your teacher should be passing out to you. Okay? In the interface control document, we call it the ICD. See? Another acronym already. What it does is it defines what the UAH team is going to give you resource-wise. Okay? So resources are the things that you're after. So these are the guaranteed maximum minimums that you're going to have. If you want more of something, you have to come back and ask for it. But just like your parents, when you ask for 20 bucks, the first question is going to be why, after right? After no. Yeah, after no is going to be why, right? So you gotta be able to explain it to them. So if you want to ask for mommy, UAH, to give you more stuff, you gotta be ready to explain it to us, okay? So the first thing we're gonna give you is five kilograms of mass, okay? Not much, just a little bit, to house your, space, your, your payload on our spacecraft, okay? So you get these five kilograms to use. Use them wisely. Don't play around with it. Make sure you've got exactly what you need. So the second thing we're gonna give you is volume. You have to have a place to sit on our spacecraft, but you can't be too big because that just don't work for us real well. So what we're gonna do is give you a volume that is 44 by 24 by 28 centimeters. It's basically a box that's the size of 10 reams of paper, okay? And you got plenty of those hanging around in high school, so you should be able to go find one of those. So while you are attached to our spacecraft, you can be no bigger than this. Once you leave us, we don't care how big you get. You can go football field size for all we care. Just when you're attached to us, this is the volume you must be in, okay? Third thing is, you must survive an environment, okay? We're not going to nice, pretty places like Earth, okay? We're going by Venus. Venus is really, really hot. It's the hottest planet on the solar system. Exactly. So you've got to worry about that one. But then we're going to go somewhere that's really, really cold, like Jupiter and Ganymede. And so you've got to be able to survive that environment. You must survive the environment from the time you deploy when we make you leave our spacecraft until you're ready to die. Okay? So once your mission is over, you just go out and, and go, hmm, and die real quick for us, all right? And at that point, we don't care if you survive the environment anymore. That brings us to the last one. You must do no harm to the UAH spacecraft, okay? NASA is really serious about things like this. When these, play, uh, when these missions go up and they have science payloads on board like this, they literally have a guillotine, a cutter, above them. And so if they go rogue, which you are not allowed to do, if they all of a sudden go, mm -mm, I'm not going to listen to you do more, they will slice through every line that touches you and kick you off the spacecraft. So you can't do that. You cannot go rogue on us. You can't go all terrorist on us. You have to stay calm, okay? So what we need you to do is once you do your mission, kind of already alluded to it, and you finish your science objective and you stop measuring whatever you're going to do, we just need you to die with a whimper. Don't go out with a bang. Every semester, somebody wants to put some explosives on board and have a lot of fun out there in space. We can't do that. You need to be boring. This is the operative word. Boring. Like us. Yes, that's it. Like him especially. So, you need to make sure and do that for us, okay? And we will check you. We will have the college kids here at UAH, Matt and I. We will even have NASA people, because especially once you go to NASA and say, I want to blow up some stuff, that's not going to work too well for us, okay? So none of that can happen. So that's the fourth thing you must make sure and do. Beyond that, you're pretty much free. As you can see here on the slide, there are several different designs from these last uh, semesters that we're showing you. So you can see kind of what the payloads look like, okay? And in your notebook, you should have a DVD 
that we made for you that holds a copy of Solid Edge ST4. Once your teacher gets the license for it, you can install this on your home computers, on computers at school, everywhere. It's good for two years. And so what you can do is make pretty drawings like this, okay? Pictures sell. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So you need to make some pictures on this thing. So you need to have somebody on your team who goes, I really like to draw and I like to play with computers, okay? And so that's like him for me because I don't do that. So they'll draw it up for you, make it look all pretty. And that's exactly what people want to do. Mm -hmm. So now let us show you what a real payload looks like on the Viking Lander. Hey gang, we are here at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. <laughs> this is the Viking Lander that landed on Mars in 1976. As you guys can see, it's about the size of a small car. Uh, PJ is going to tell you about some of the payloads that are on the Viking Lander. So the cool thing about the Viking Lander, when it landed on Mars, it was to look for life. And so what they did is they decided to uh, put an arm on board to scoop up some of the dirt. So you can see the arm right here, and so you can see it's considered a payload, which is what you guys are going to be doing this semester for us. So you can see kind of the size and shape of it, and also on top you can see several of the different experiments that they use on the lander. So you can see kind of the scope, the, the size of them, and kind of their mass, and so that's what you'll be doing for us this entire semester. So now that you've seen what a real spacecraft looks like in the Air and Space Museum, we're going to tell you how all that comes together. So planetary science missions is what we're working on, okay? This is a part of NASA, and their job, obviously, is to explore all the planets. They're forbidden from touching the sun or the moon. They don't like those, but the rest of them are up for grabs. The sun's pretty hot anyway. Even ones that we get rid of, like Pluto. They've got a mission going to Pluto right now, and see, we lucked up. We did we, we launched it before we decided we wouldn't uh, uh, plant it anymore, so that worked out for us here. A great example is the mission that just landed on Mars, the uh, Curiosity rover. That's a planetary science mission. A big one, but it's a planetary science mission. Yep. So these things cost multi-millions of dollars, even billions, billions of dollars. Billions. Yes, billions of dollars, and so that's what we go do. So, but it's a very long process. It just isn't like we go, hey, let's go to Mars, and we go tomorrow. Yeah, like it takes. Week, uh, yeah, I'm free next week. How about you? Yeah. 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 So we can't do that either. So this is like a 10 to 20 year thing just to be able to get these spacecraft up. So what we first do is NASA says, where should we go? What should we do? And so they go ask the planetary science community. This is about 3,000 Sheldons, for those of you who watch Big Bang, in the, in the world that come together and decide what to do. So that's a lot of fun to watch. Mm -hmm. um, you think we're boring, you should see them. Um, <laughs> so the planetary science community gets together and they what, uh, to create what's called the decadal survey. So every 10 years, NASA says, what should we do for the next 10 years? So they come up with this decadal survey and so they, they prioritize, they tell us what to do. Because we get about $1.4 billion a year to work on these kinds of things. And that sounds like a lot of money, but it really isn't. And so NASA has to decide what should be done when. And so that's what they do. So once they figure that out, they go and get these genius planetary scientists back together. And all of them decide what are the real objectives, what's the science we need to do. Okay, so when we go to Ganymede, what should we do there? When we go to Mars, really what should we be after? When we go anywhere in the solar system, what are we really after? The big thing right now is life. We're trying to find out does a little bacteria or a little amoeba live in conditions that are not like Earth? Because if so, that's a pretty cool thing. Scary too, mm -hmm. because it doesn't have, can, not, can't be killed by what we do, but that's the side point. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're after in this. So these scientists come together and they form a team and they create what the mission should do. Then they ask, the engineers to figure it out for them because all they've done is cooked up these ideas. The engineers come in and say, you can't do that, that's real stupid, okay? And so they go and ask them. So they go to NASA and usually they go to what's called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Really cool place to go, really neat. Pasadena is really expensive, but that's side of the point. They wear uh, lots of Hawaiian t-shirts. Yes, so if you don't want to have to dress up in life, go work at JPL. Yeah. Um, so JPL comes up with the spacecraft. So they, they sit down and go, what does this spacecraft look like? What is the concept? All that kind of stuff comes out, okay? So then they create the spacecraft concept, which you can see in the left-hand corner. Okay, Beth? Yeah, I don't know my direction right now. Left-hand corner. Um, these are actually two spacecraft that were designed here at UAH. So the one on the far left is a Mars lander, and the other one is a Venus orbiter. So they create these designs. They make sure everything's right. 
And if it's all working out great, they go and build it, okay? And so what you can see here is the Cassini spacecraft in the middle. The Cassini spacecraft went to Saturn. It is the largest spacecraft we ever flew from this planet. It weighed 6,000 kilograms, six metric tons at launch. So it's a very large spacecraft. You can see at the bottom, if you look at it closely, there's a man. He's about six foot tall, so you can see how big this spacecraft is because it takes a lot to get to these planets. On the side of this spacecraft is a thing called Huygens. I didn't spit. That name's Huygens. It's a probe. Um, and so this probe was given to us by the European Space Agency because these missions are so expensive. This one cost over $3 billion for us to do. We build part of it and another country can build part of it. So we got the European Space Agency to give us Huygens. And so what Huygens did was plummet into the atmosphere of Titan. Titan is one of the moons of Saturn. If you're a Star Trek geek, it's the moon that was used in the, in the first Star Trek, the new Star Trek movie, where they came out of warp and they were hiding, and so they came out of Titan was the really cool part of that. Mm -hmm. So at Titan, it's a moon, but unlike our moon, it has an atmosphere. And so what they found out with this probe is that it rains liquid methane on this planet, on this moon. And the methane drops, not like little drops on Earth, they're huge, they're gigantic drops. So it's really cool, it's raining liquid, but it's methane, not water. So they're trying to figure out, is there life on that place? And we also found out that there's lakes there of methane. So that's how the spacecraft works. So once you design it and you build it, then you have to launch it, okay? It has to fly, it has to get off this planet. So what we do right now is we go down to the Kennedy Space Center to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and we launch these spacecraft. What's really cool about this, the launch vehicles that are used for this are built in Decatur, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. If you ever get a chance, you can go down to the plant and see them actually building a launch vehicle, building a huge rocket. And that's really cool to see all that stuff. So from the beginning of this, all the way back here at the, hmm, what else should we do in the planetary science world, to it launching is about 10 to 20 years just to get that part done. Then you got to fly there, which is unbelievable because these things aren't close. This is not like, oh, I got to go an hour away. Oh, darn. No. Going to Mars, Curiosity took eight and a half months to get to Mars. And that's just Mars. Yeah, it's the closest one to us. Mm -hmm. And so that's amazing. And so the other missions that we work on, they take long, long time to get there. And so that's part of the job in doing this is you got to realize how long it takes. That's how a planetary science mission works for us. We'll show you some previous designs of Payways because now you're probably wondering, so what is my thing gonna look like, right? And so, and I have no clue what a payload still is. That's okay. Right now, we understand it. You're sitting there going, oh dear Lord, who are these turkeys? That's all you're doing. And so, but we'll help you get through it. So I want to show you some previous designs and really what they do is look at what works well on Earth. Then take it to space is really what you're about. Don't create something brand new. Don't go, woo, I get to go play and have some fun and create some wild thing. No, take something on the ground that you go, hmm, that works really, really well. We do that a lot here on Earth. Let's see if we can do it in space. And that's really what you're gonna do. Because what you can see up in the corner is a deployer for some probes that we're shooting out at the planet. The dude, the chief engineer who was on this team, he has asthma. And so it's based off his asthma inhaler works pretty well. So he used the whole conceptual design of that. Down here in the other corner, you see this wild contraption that was actually drawn in PowerPoint. You don't have to use solid edge, but we need you to draw up some stuff. So you can even put it in PowerPoint if you want to. This is based off of a gumball machine, okay? When you crank it, put in the quarter, whatever it is now, quarter, crank it, and the little ball goes, dun, 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 you know, that's exactly what this machine is based off of. It actually makes that noise when it does it. It's exactly. Really, it's really... I saw it in space. It's really weird. Yeah, it's very strange. Yeah. So, I just wanted to show you a few of the designs. This one is an arm. This is a little projectile thing. Now, this one, let me give you a little story about this one. This is one of those, do no harm, right? They violated it in the beginning because they were shooting little projectiles out and you will leave us. Make sure and don't shoot straight up. Okay, because you're gonna come right back down. There's, there's no atmosphere in most of these places, right? We don't have wind on Ganymede. We don't have wind on Callisto. And so that's something you gotta remember. So when they were first doing it, they were gonna attack us. Uh, that, that ain't cool. We don't like that no more. So we had to make them turn their thing around. So you gotta make sure and do that. And you'll do it without even thinking about it. So we'll have to watch you. See, we had to catch that one. So those are some of the designs that we've had before. 
So, what we're gonna do next week when we come see you is we're gonna bring you some cool toys and we're gonna show them to you now. So, Matt's gonna hold the launch vehicle model. This is a model. This yeah. is not the real launch They're vehicle. It's much bigger. It's a lot bigger and costs a lot more money than this thing, mm -hmm. okay? This portion is about the size of a school bus. Yeah, so it's big. Very Pretty big. Mm -hmm. So next week we're going to tell you about this and how all it works and might break it even in front of you, yeah, which is kind of fun. So we'll talk about that one with you. Um, we also have a few more models. This is this part of this one. So this is a bigger model of this part. And this is one of the spacecraft that went up to the moon called L-Cross, which we'll explain next week to you as well. Oh, you want to hold that one? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we even have a bigger model of this thing. So. We'll tell you all about this next week, but we wanted to show you kind of a preview, make you go, oh, I can't wait for next week. I cannot wait either. What is it gonna happen? So we'll be there and see you and talk to you then. So excited. Okay, so as I told you before, kind of gave you a little preview, we're going to Ganymede this semester. And so what Ganymede, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It is actually larger than the planet Mercury, which is kind of cool mm -hmm. if you think about it. Ganymede is called a Galilean moon. So what that means is Galileo actually found it in 16 something something. Galileo found out by looking through his telescope, which he made in 16 something, uh, was that there were these objects that rotated around Jupiter and not us. And that was a big, huge discovery back in the 1600s. Because up until that point, everyone believed, and it was common knowledge, that everything revolved around Earth because Earth was, of course, the center of the universe. We always thought that. Yeah. And it kind of makes sense. If you think about it from the 1600s point of view, you know, God, those dumb people, they actually saw everything in the sky going, wow, look, it moves around us. That, oh, that must be what it is. It's all us, you mm -hmm. know, no big deal. Galileo went, I don't think so, <clears throat> wrong. He said, there's this thing out there, this big, huge ball of gas I see, this planet, and they called it Jupiter, and he said, there's these things that rotate around it. There's these four things I can see because he figured out there was four moons, the four Galilean moons. So he said that. So he figured out that those four were doing that. So he went, mm, maybe not so much. Maybe we got this theory wrong about us being the center of the earth, our center of the universe. And so that actually helped us form the solar system and form the way we look at everything from that. Galileo really did that. He's kind of cool. Um, so we're going to Ganymede. Like I said before, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system, larger than the planet Mercury. So, but it's a lot like our moon. If you look at it, this little picture of it, which ain't that great, but it's, a, it's um, a picture of it. If you looked at it, just kind of glancing at it, you'd think it was our moon, but it's a lot larger than our moon. Because if you look at Jupiter, and you guys should go out and talk and look around and review Jupiter, kind of study it for us. Jupiter is kind of like a solar system in and of itself. It's a huge ball of gas. Hydrogen and helium just sitting there kind of swirling around together, and it's got 50 billion moons, and it's got all kinds of stuff. So it's this gigantic planet. I mean, the red eye, the eye on Jupiter, is larger than Earth itself. Three times larger. Yes. Thank you, Matt, for that comment. You're welcome. So that's the kind of thing this Jupiter is gigantic for, and so it has the largest moon. Kind of makes sense. So when we go there, there's these science objectives that we need to accomplish. These are ours to do at UAH. You need to figure out something else to do that kind of maybe helps us with this or kind of comes up with something brand new to do. So what they're going to look at is Ganymede has an ocean. It has a subsurface ocean. It is rock on the outside, but underneath it, they believe there's salt water, which is kind of weird if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So unlike our planet where the water's on the top, they believe the water's underneath the crust. So they're going to have to go figure that out. So we're, our job is to go look at that. Maybe you want to go do something like that with us. Maybe you want to slam into the planet, slam into the moon and go, hey, look, I found the water. So that's the kind of stuff you can come up with. They also want to look at the geology of the planet, so or the moon. So geology is basically dirt. <laughs> I know geologists would go, oh my God, you're saying it so wrong, but I don't care. It's dirt, it's rocks. You know, they're going, wow, look at that pretty rock. Isn't that cool? Oh, look at that one. That's a little bit different over there. That's the kind of thing that geologists do. So they want to look at its geology and how it works. They also want to look at Ganymede's magnetic field and its magnetosphere. Um, I know crap about a magnetic field, so Matt's going to tell you about it. Jupiter's magnetic field is actually the largest entity in the solar system. And it includes, and it actually engulfs Ganymede itself. But Ganymede has its own magnetic field that's created. Scientists don't actually know why it's created. Earth has a magnetic field, right? We have this, this, this core that's molten uh, magma. You know, it's, it's, a mag it's, a, 
It's a uh, it, it's a conducting metal and it moves right our core. That that creates our that we saw the movie core. Yeah, the core. Well, that's a bad movie. Don't watch that movie. But um, I think it's it was really terrible. Uh, anyway, so um, this moving conductor creates Earth's magnetic field. They don't know why Ganymede has a magnetic field. They don't. They don't think it has a uh, a, a rotating moving core like a live core like ours. But they wonder. Okay, is it? Is, is, is Ganymede's magnetic field induced by Jupiter? Because Jupiter's magnetic field is so big and so strong. They don't know. They want to figure that out. That's part of what they want to lo um, look at at Ganymede and, and, and around Ganymede and Jupiter. PJ? The next thing they want to talk about or go look at is Ganymede's origin. Okay? So the four inner moons, the four moons that Galileo figured out, uh, Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa, they're all a little bit different. They have a different surface feature. They have different things about it. So how did all of this come to pass? Was there this gigantic rock that came in and exploded apart and made these moons? Or how did it all come to be? Because Jupiter is a big gas planet. It's not like our planet that has surface, right? We can all stand on the dirt and say, look at that Alabama dirt. They don't have that on Jupiter. You just fall through the atmosphere forever and ever and ever. Well, you get crushed eventually because pressure is really high up there. That's side of the point. Um, so that's the kind of thing they're going to look at. They want to look at the deep interior surface of Ganymede, figure out is that magnetic uh, field, is there something down there that's swirling around like ours, or what's the deal, why is it all working that way? That's the kind of thing. They want to understand the interaction with the rest of the Jovian system, the Jupiter system. How, because they all spin, they do all these wild things around there, so how's that working? What does that do to the planets? Does it make them pull each other, the moons pull each other? Because there's a man named Newton who said, two bodies become attracted to each other the closer they get. And so that kind of thing's out there. So they're wanting to figure that out. And then they're also, because the way we have to get to Ganymede, we gotta go flying by Callisto, one of the other moons. They wanna look at Callisto, because it probably has an ocean underneath it. That's water, not salt water, just regular water, and it's interior. So they want to figure out that kind of stuff too. So there's a lot of cool things you could do with us. And so that's what we wanna make sure you can, you can understand. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to have a real scientist from California uh, tell you about a minute's worth of video about Ganymede itself. Not a fake one, by the way. A real scientist. Yes. And so um, bear with us. The resolution's not that great, but this is a video from real scientists in California. And also, just as a footnote, go out there. If you Google Ganymede, make sure you spell Ganymede correctly because it's kind of funny. Uh, Google Ganymede. There's lots of YouTube videos. There's tons of stuff on Jupiter. I mean, tons of literally tons of stuff. And uh, so go out there, research Jupiter, research Ganymede, and uh, that will help you a lot when you're, dis when you're trying to determine what you want to do for your science objective. Now the video. Jupiter's Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system, just under 5,300 kilometers in diameter. That's 8% larger than Mercury and twice the size of tiny Pluto. Ganymede has an old, fractured surface covered in grooves and fissures. This dark surface is heavily cratered and fairly old. But also watery material has apparently erupted on the surface of Ganymede at some point in the past to form deposits. In some cases the gray surface soils have been blasted away by meteoric impacts to reveal the whiter ice. The possibility of water and ice on Ganymede is very exciting. Ganymede's orbit is too circular for tidal heating to have created the heat needed to make water ice erupt. However, its orbit may have had irregularities in the past that could have led to tidal heating. Okay, now that you've had that riveting account from the planetary scientists, aren't they fun, mm -hmm. uh, about Ganymede, let us tell you a little bit more about the mission because this is the kind of stuff you've got to do to understand to be able to plan your payload and what you're going to do. So we're going to launch on a launch vehicle that looks something like this. Be a lot bigger. Remember, model. This is not the full thing, but it's going to be a big launch vehicle. Okay? We will launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Hopefully some of you got to go down there. If you went to Disney World, just go about an hour east. Bing, bang, boom, you're there. We launch off the coast because that's what we have to do. So we'll launch from the Kennedy Space Center. It'll put us in orbit around Earth. We'll make sure everything's ready to go and we'll send it on its way. We're first going to fly by Venus. Because to get to an outer planet, out there, way out in the solar system, it takes a lot of energy. So what we do is the slingshot effect. 
You know, have you ever sat there and, and pulled like a yo-yo or something and swung, swung it for a while, then let go of it, it goes flying off in a direction. That's exactly what we need to do here. So we gotta swing it around and spin it up before we let go of it. So what we do is we go to planets to do that. So when we go by them, there's this thing called the conservation of momentum. You probably have learned about this in high school somewhere, maybe in will. a physics class, you or you will, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's the conservation of momentum. So what we do is go by a planet and we steal part of its momentum. We impart it on the spacecraft and literally slow the planet down. Just a little bit. The planets are so big, it's not going to do a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, we fly by Earth a lot, so it's not like tomorrow we're going to go, oh crap, there's no longer 24 hours and day is 25. Mm -mm, not going to happen. But eventually it will slow us down over millennium and stuff like that. But that's what we're doing. They did the same thing if you've seen Apollo 13, the movie with Tom Hanks and uh, uh, people. Other, other people. Yeah. Uh, they were out there, they were stranded, they had to get back to Earth, they flew around the back side of the moon and came back to Earth, they accelerated on the back side of the moon, the moon gave them the uh, momentum they needed to get back to Earth. Same sort of principle, we're doing it at Venus, we're going to do it actually multiple times, Venus, Earth, Earth, and then out to, uh, out to the outer solar system. Yeah, so we're going to go what's called the Vega, that's what Matt just said. Venus, Earth, Earth, gravity assist. <laughs> so see, you can be on NASA E's and say, we're doing oh. the Vega. So the Vega will take us by Venus. So on the way there, you don't have to do something at Ganymede. You could do something at Venus. And so we'll fly by Venus, and the, the lowest we ever get to Venus is 3,200 kilometers. That will become important later on if you decide to do something at Venus. But Venus is neat. Venus is a big, huge greenhouse effect. It's got carbon dioxide everywhere. It's really hot. Very and so, like, hottest, hottest one in the solar system. It can melt lead. I mean, it can do lots of iron, lead, all yeah, of them. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of them combined, you can melt them all. Um, so, it's a really cool place. We can't even land there. We haven't ever been able to do it because it's so hard to do. Russians tried it. Mother Russia says they did it, but we don't believe it. Nope, they so, didn't do it. <laughs> um, that's something you could do. Then we'll keep on going by and we'll come up to Jupiter, right? We're going to go outer planet. We don't get to go by Mars because it's not aligned right with us. So, we'll keep on flying by, but we'll get to Jupiter. We'll fly by Jupiter. Jupiter, gigantic planet, right? You could do all kinds of cool stuff in the atmosphere. You could plunge into the great eye. You could plunge into the mini eye or whatever they call it because they found a new storm that's the size of Earth now on there. It's, it's tiny. Yeah, it's <laughs> tiny. It's so small. It's only the size of Earth. But these are gigantic uh, hurricanes, cyclones on this place. I mean, we're talking 400, 500 mile an hour winds. This is fast stuff. There's tons of videos online that talk about the great spot on Jupiter. If you want to look that up, there's... So if you're interested in that, go, go search on YouTube, tons of stuff, literally. Yep. So we're going to go by Jupiter. But then we've got to slow down, right? So this is the problem, is we've had to speed up mm -hmm. to get us out there and get us on our way. But then we've got to put on the brakes because we don't want to be the proverbial bug on the windshield. That's not a good idea with a billion dollar spacecraft. No. That's not going to look good for anybody. No. So we've got to slow down, but to slow down with chemical energy, would take a lot and we wouldn't have as much. So what we're going to do is fly by Callisto and, and other different moons, but the one we will definitely fly by is Callisto. And we'll fly by it at 200 kilometers and it will start to slow us down because Callisto is going to go, hey, I like you, come here. And it will pull it down and start the slow down process. So we'll fly by Callisto a lot to slow us down. So on one flyby, we get to 200 kilometers. That's the lowest we ever get. Another point you have to know when we start figuring it out. So if you go, hey, I want to go play on Callisto. Then you're going to throw you off. We're going to kick you off that spacecraft at 200 kilometers in altitude. So you got to be able to survive that. So that's going to be something. Then what we'll do, because we'll have an orbiter and a lander at Ganymede, the orbiter will go into orbit of Ganymede at 200 kilometers. So you could stay in orbit and go, hey, I'm going to hang out up here. I'm going to go play around up here. I'm going to drop off and go down to Ganymede in different places and all that kind of stuff. You could do that. And then we'll actually take a lander and land on the moon itself. So you could even want to say on the, all the way down and say, hey, I'm going to do some cool surface stuff. I don't want to go underground. I don't want to do all that stuff. I want to go do some cool surface stuff on Ganymede. So you'd say, hey, I want to hit you right on the moon, on the moon, on the lander. Okay? So you have to tell us where you want to drop off and what part of the spacecraft you want to be on, the orbiter or the lander. It is your choice. You get to pick all of this fun stuff. And all of that depends on your science objectives. What do you want to look at? What do you want to do? Yes. Uh, so that's that's up to you guys. It's your mission. Yep. That was anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
There are several jobs on this team. It takes a village to be a team. Okay? Is that what the words? Mm -hmm. it takes a village yeah. to be yeah. something. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, Hillary Clinton. Okay. So it takes a lot of people. There are going to be engineers, but there's also got to be other people involved. Marketing, communications, because there are going to be people going, Woohoo! I love design. Let me geek out on this. And make all this wonderful stuff. Yes, just like that. And so you'll be doing that. But you also have to realize you create this cool payload, but if you can't sell it to anybody, if you can't market it to anybody, what did it really mean? Nope. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there's several different jobs on this team that we're going to have. First one is the engineers. Okay? So there's going to be an engineering team headed by a chief engineer. Okay? And so their job is going to be to basically create the payload. They're going to start with the science objective. Uh, we're going to make up what's called a science traceability matrix. So we'll talk about that with you where you say, I want to do this. And then we'll take you through that. Oh, cool. Look at the instrument that I found that can do that for me. That's what a science traceability matrix does. You understand engineering requirements. You got to worry about the ICD, the interface control document, those constraints. You got to worry about the environments you're going to be in. You know, going to Venus, really, really hot. Going to Ganymede, pretty freaking cold. Jupiter's so, got a lot of radiation. Yeah, so you got to be able to handle all that. So you're going to have to go work on that with us. Functions. You've got to figure out what does your payload have to do. Okay? That's what functions are. They are not, oh, look at the pretty widget. No. What was it supposed to do? What was the, the function that was involved in doing it? That's the kind of thing we're going to have to talk to you about. And then also the science. So what do the instruments require of you? Okay? Certain instruments say, hey, I need to do something. I need to do this. I need to do that. And so you've got to make sure you get all of that under control as well. You're going to create alternative solutions. So far, probably in high school, what you've done so far is you've had a problem given to you and there is one answer. That is not the real world. In the real world, there's one problem and there's 50 billion ways you could do it, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're gonna come up with at least two ways you could do this payload. And then what we're gonna do is teach you a method to then choose which one is best, okay? And best is in the eye of the beholder, so we'll have to work with you on that as well. So we'll get all that with you as well. Then you'll determine if your, your solution meets the requirements, you're gonna analyze it. Matt will probably teach you more physics and, and get with you a lot. Plus, the UAH students are going to help you as well. Mm -hmm. So all that's going to come to pass. And then the engineers are also going to create a prototype. We want some physical representation of your payload at your open house, which we'll talk about in a minute. We need something. It doesn't have to be made out of metal. It doesn't have to be out of wood. It could be styrofoam. It could be whatever. Just you figure out what you want to make it out of. and Because we want to be able, engineers like to touch and feel things, right? You want to be able to go, look at my widget. You don't want to go, look at my pretty picture. You need to have something else. Last year we had a team use salad bowls. Uh, they wrapped salad bowls in aluminum foil. And anything wrapped in aluminum foil looks like it belongs in space. By crunch that. Just a heads yeah, up. Crunch yeah, crunch that. Yeah, it looks awesome. Yeah. So they put, put salad bowls. This is our, this is our, it was an entry capsule. Yeah. This is our payload. Uh, a couple years ago, a team went and bought a wooden sphere, a hollow ball from Hobby Lobby, cut it in half, put cordless phone parts in it, and said, this is our, you know, this is our experiment. And everyone was like, oh, what is that? And they made up, you know, oh, this is the you know, accelerometer. This is the, it was cordless phone parts. But it worked. They, it helped tell their story. That's the whole point of it, just to tell the story. Yep. So there's also a marketing team. So you've got to learn how to market your idea. So these people have to come up with team identity. You've got to become a team, okay? You just can't say, oh, we are West Point. Oh, we are Gunnersville 3. No, that's not going to work for us. You got to come up with we are team Death Star, you know, whatever, anything that you want to be. What are you doing? Team, like, uh, he's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to come up with team names. Working. You know, whatever you want to do. Team logos. It's probably going to be related to your high school or yeah. something about your payload. Or an you know. acronym. Yeah, an acronym. Mm. Ooh, NASA loves the acronyms. Remember yes, that. So you've got to come up with that kind of stuff. They're going to work on this marketing team, the, uh, the poster that you're going to have at Open House. At the end of the semester, you're going to come up to UAH. We're going to have this big, huge thing where all the community comes out to see you, and they're going to come up and say, so what the heck have you been doing? And you got to tell them, hey, I've been doing this and this and this, and look at my pretty poster, look at my uh, whole thing I'm doing. And here's so, a flyer. Right. And <laughs> so you're going to have a poster as a part of that, because you want someone to go, that is really interesting. i got to walk over there and see what that is. Mm -hmm. That's what the poster is supposed to do. So it needs to be kind of like a movie poster, you know, something like that. So you can see two examples at the bottom of this slide. This one over here, they were called Dark Side. 
And so but what they did is they took Darth Vader and kind of made him melt it, which kind of made you go, what in the world are they doing? Mm -hmm. So it made you want to come over and look at it, okay? You can see, not a lot of, lot of text. Don't be boring. Don't make it all text. This is the, wow, look how pretty this is. Look how cool. And know? of course, Dark Side was an acronym. It stood for something. I yeah. forgot what it stood for. But uh, it was an acronym, and they even spelled side with a C, but it still worked. Yes. So you can misspell things, and it's okay for yes. us. We're engineers. We have like eight S's in Inspire, so yeah. it's all good. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we're engineers. We're not English teachers. Mm -hmm. Remember that. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Last thing we want the marketing team to do is develop a website. Go to Google Sites and create a website about your payload, your team, what you've done, the experience you've went through, and then you can show it. Now it'll teach you how to do a QR code. QR codes. They're yeah, awesome. you'll geek out. You'll all like the geeks them. will like them. Mm -hmm. And they can then have it where their little iPhone will go, oh, look at your pretty website at the open house. And so that will be a really cool thing to do as well. So we want the marketing team to do all that for us over the semester. The last team that's going to be involved is the communications team. Okay, The marketing team will be headed by what's called the marketing coordinator. All right, The communications team will be headed by the communications director. Okay, so. What they've got to do is be able to communicate all of this out to the world. So there's these written documents, okay? This is the only thing that all of the UAH students will ever see of you. They won't get to see your smiley, happy faces every week like me and Matt, or even the UAH person that you work with on a weekly basis. They, the only thing they will see is the written word, okay? So you've got to be able to concisely and precisely tell them the whole story from beginning to end. At the preliminary design review, which is only six weeks away, you will give us what's called the design status document. It can be no more than four pages. So you got to tell us pretty quickly what you want to do or what your plan is and how you're going to do it. Okay? By the end of the semester, at the end in December, when we are finished with you, you only get five pages. We only give you one more page in what's called the payload concept proposal or the PCP as we call it. And so you've got to be able to do this quickly. This is probably the hardest part of the job is this one because you can't see someone's reaction to what you're doing. And so that's going to be really rough. Open house, you can see people and they go, you know, oh my Lord. And you go, oh, I can see you're a little bit confused. Let me tell you a little bit more. During the presentation to NASA, the NASA people go, what? You know, and they'll do something. And they'll ask you questions. Yeah, and they'll ask you questions. But this document, no questions. It's no seeing. Here, it's, done. Yes, read. And so you've got to make sure and get that correct. Um, there's also briefings. We've talked about it before. This is the only thing in the end that NASA will see. They won't see your smiling happy faces all year, all semester either. They will only see this briefing. This 15 minutes is all they will see of your entire semester. So you've got to make sure you got everything right with that. So at the preliminary design review, which we'll talk about in a minute, you have 10 minutes to brief. UAH. UAH professors will come down to your high school and visit you and they will be your board for your design review, your preliminary design review. So you get 10 minutes to tell them where you are, what your issues are, that kind of thing. At critical design review, which will be six weeks after that, near the end of the semester, you'll get 15 minutes. It's basically practice for the NASA review. What we're going to do this semester is we're going to have professionals from industry, from around Huntsville and everywhere else, come to your high school and they will be your review board. So they're going to ask you the tough questions and get you ready for the NASA review. That is the ultimate goal out of all of this is you want to ace the NASA review. So that's what we're going to do is get you ready for that. Because at the NASA review, you only get 15 minutes as well. Mm -hmm. They get 10 minutes to ask you questions. We're and gonna make the, over. We're going to make the critical design review pretty tough, pretty critical. But the, the, but the point is, is to make you better for the NASA review. The critical design review, like PJ said, it's practice for the NASA review. So, you know, give you a hard time with the critical design review so you can just breeze through the NASA review. That's the point. So this shows you the structure that we've talked to your teachers about doing this semester, how your team is set up. So you got the teacher at the top. She or he is the chief. They're the CEO of the company. They're the ones that get to control everything. If you don't do what they do, want you to do, you will fail. Mm -hmm. So that's up to you as to whether or not you want your to listen to Your teacher is the only one that assigns grades. We have nothing to do with your grades. No. So we we might love you, but yeah. she might or he might hate you, don't and that's the way it goes. Ask us about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so remember, your first duty is to do what they tell you to do more than what we tell you to do. You don't pass physics in high school, you're not going to be able to do this. You know, it's just bad. Right. <laughs> so the next person down is the chief of the team. We call them the project manager. 
That is the person that holds the ultimate authority, can decide how everything works. So this person's got to be organized, make sure they got due dates under control, schedules, you know, making sure all the team's working together. We call them the cheerleader. They're the ones that got to keep everybody going. Because about halfway through this, you're going to go, this is sucky. I don't want to do this anymore. And project managers are going to have to come back in and go, no, no, we're going to keep going and it's fun, you know, and, and working with you. So that's the kind of thing you got to do. This person doesn't have to be an actual cheerleader, but they want to motivate. And you're, this person is not They technical. don't have to have pom-poms? No, they do not. It's, oh, wow. It's, it's a plus, though. It's a bonus sometimes. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. Uh, you... Uh, the PM, the project manager, is not, a, is not technical necessarily. They, they should be able to understand the project if they're asked questions about it, but they're not. Their primary focus is getting everything done. The chief engineer is the technical person, which PJ is going to tell you about right now. Go for it. So, the next in command is the chief engineer. So, this is the chief technical geek, you know? Chief geek. This is the chief geek. This is the person when we come in and say, so, how much does the payload weigh today? You should be able to say it's 2.35 kilograms. You know, that's the kind of thing we need from this person. So they'll lead the engineering team. Okay, engineering team's job: create this payload, create the design, create how it's going to work. That's called the concept of operations. All that is on your plate to figure that out. The other teams, communications, one of them, right? So it's led by the communications director. They worry about all the written documents and the briefings. And they also make sure and communicate weekly with UAH. What we want is that communications director to have an email address and email UAH every week and say, we've done this this week. We're having a little trouble on this. Could you help us out, please? You know, that kind of thing. That's what we want to know in like two or three sentences what's up that week. We can't stress this enough. It's really important to stay in touch with your UAH counterpart because they're going to be responsible for giving you uh, points at the end of the semester. And if they've never heard anything from you, they're going to be less inclined to give you lots of points. And you want points. And you need help. Yes. So, mm -hmm. you got to remember that too. It, it might be a little scary to talk to a senior in college, but you got to get over it and say, hey, I need some help. We, we totally don't know what we're doing right now. And they'll be able to come back and say, well, look at this, look at that, and give you some guidance. They are not going to give you the answer. That is not their job. Their job is to help guide you along and let you understand how to do this. But anytime you email a UAH person, you got to CC PJ and CC your teacher. Yes. We'll talk to you about that. Right. Um, the last team is the marketing team, headed by the marketing coordinator. So their job basically is a marketing plan. How they gonna? Are you gonna create flyers? You can create little cool shirts with little acronyms on them. Well, what are you gonna do? See, he's got the boring UAH one. I got the inspires one. Um, logos. Logos. Flat you know, ones. yeah. See, do you want a nice mm -hmm. like a whole little outfit kind of thing going or? Do you want to be you know, weird? Whatever you want to do, it's up to y'all. Do you want to be weird? Do you want to be weird, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's a marketing plan, there's logos, there's posters, there's the open house, there's the website. So they get to do all that kind of stuff to keep the marketing aspect of this all together. And this is but, not something you want to put off until the last of the part of the semester. This is not something you can do in like a week or two. Well, You want to continue to do this. You have assignments every week in these areas yes. as well. So we will be monitoring that as well as your teacher and how we're doing this this semester. Mm -hmm. I think Matt forgot about that little part. So it, this whole thing is a team. There's not any one part that's more important than the other. If you look at it, this part's got the payload itself. This part's got to write all about it and tell everybody in the world about it. And these people have got to market it and make it look cool. All of these things have to come together to make you win. Because in the end, that's what you want, is to win the competition is what you're after. So those are the three teams we think will work really well with you. So once we're done this, this, this week, this video, you need to sit down and think, I like being a geek, I could be a chief engineer, you know? Or I really like marketing, I think I could have some fun at that. Or I like to talk a lot, so I could be a communications person. Or whew, I'm an organizer, let me be the project manager, let me see if I can do that. Those are the kinds of things you need to figure out as a team, what you're gonna do, and it's up to you your team and your teacher to determine who are the leaders. Those four people we call the leadership. And so those four are going to be key to the success of this project. Now just because you're on communications or marketing does not mean that you don't have to understand the technical part of your design also. In order to write about your design for communications, you have to understand it at least a little bit. So, and, and also in order to market your design, you need to understand it as well. So this doesn't let you off the hook for these two parts, okay? You got to understand the technical as well. So, we talked about competition. So, who is your competition? This semester, there's going to be six, yeah, six divisions in the, in the project. So, there's 
division A, division B, division C, division D, division E, division F. Pretty simple, right? Okay, so you can see down through here, depending on where you are, which high school you're a part of, which team you're a part of, as to who your competition is, okay? So there's Florence High School is involved with this semester. There's Spartan High School, Grissom High School, which someone went to school at. Uh, West Point High School, there's uh, Minemont High School, there's Gunnersville High School. So there's eight, nine, nine high schools that are working with us this semester. There's a total of 30 teams. You will be competing against four other teams, and that's what you've got to remember throughout this whole thing. So that is your competition. Inside your classroom, you are not competing against one another, okay? Even if you have multiple so, teams. Yeah, there's multiple teams in the high school not competing, right? Or in your classroom. No, not in the classroom. So like Vinemont. Vinemont 1 is not competing against Vinemont 2 or competing against Vinemont 3. So if one of your teams is having an issue and someone else in that class has the solution, help them. Mm -hmm. That's a part of it. You can have a clean sweep if you have multiples, okay? The only competition occurs under a division. So right. A, B, C, that's the only competition. We don't have any cross competition at all. Right. So that's the big thing. So you might be saying, well, how do we win this competition? How do we win it, PJ? I don't know. You don't? <laughs> no. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it's about our three components, okay? We sum it all up into three things. Uh, there is the open house booth is the first component. So this display where you come to UAH and you create this 10 by 10, 10 foot by 10 foot floor space thing that talks about your payload and your team and what all is going on. It is worth 25% of the score. So there will be people from outside the university in the Huntsville community who will come in and they will actually score you on different aspects of your, your design of your display and how you talk to them and things like that. It's all in the competition rules in the front of your book as to what their criteria are. Then 25% of the score is based off of that payload concept proposal. We give you the DSD as sort of a dry run, but then the payload concept proposal has to be turned into us, and at that point we go, our UH students evaluate it. So they sit down and score it per criteria in the competition rules, and they give you a number as well. That's 25% of it. Then 50% of it it's based on the NASA review presentation, okay? So one half of it is totally about that. So what we need you to do at that point is in 15 minutes, convince NASA you have the best idea of your division. And so that's what that's all about. One thing of note that you need to know more than anything else, the payload concept proposal is due Wednesday, November 28th by midnight. We don't really care, we're in college. Uh, we don't have three o'clock as we, when we go home. Um, so if you do not have your payload concept proposal in by Wednesday, November 28th, you are disqualified from the rest of the competition. This is the way the government works. They tell you to do something by a certain date. If you don't have it done, it's out of it. You don't get to have a redo, okay? Do not do that. We have disqualified teams in the past because they didn't take that part seriously. You need to make sure that is a, a number one thing you're looking at. Project manager, communication director, everybody needs to real, realize, circle on your calendar November 28th, because that's the date that you've got to have it done. We've got photos from open houses from the previous two semesters. We've got lots of open house photos you can go look at. We'll, we'll give you the website for that. We've got um, uh, payload concept proposals from last semester and the semester, before, actually every year since we've done Inspires. We've got those on the inspires.org website. Uh, we've got NASA briefings on that website too, so we, we, you have examples to look at. Okay, what's a good one? Which one's won last semester? What's a good booth? What is a booth? What is a mean booth? What, I don't even know what this means. So we've got examples for you to go look at. Use those resources and see, okay, what are, you know, what are we talking about here? What are we going to be up against? Those kind of things. You want to know uh, what you're going to be doing when you start. Yeah. So key things you need to start reviewing that are in your notebook. There's the competition rules. Inside your notebook, you should have all these pages and you've got dividers to put in there in the different uh, lessons or weeks that we're going to be with you. But in the front of your book, there's going to be called what's called the competition rules and the, a copy of the ICD. So the competition rules tell you what you have to do for the competition, what formats you have to do, what fonts you have to use, what naming conventions for your files you have to do, where do you submit them. All that stuff is in there. You must follow that. That is the first rule of this. Okay. Um, Another thing is the interface control document is that is down there. 
Um, it basically outlines the requirements between UAH and you guys. All right? You all need to review it, especially the project manager and the chief engineer, because when we come see you next week, what we're going to do is say, sign it. So, number one rule of life, if you have to sign something, read it and understand it before you do that. Mm -hmm. So next week, the project manager, the chief engineer, and the teacher will sign along with me and Matt to say, these are the rules we're going to live by for this semester. These are the rules that are going to happen. Then there's also the Inspires website, www.inspires.org, right? Two S's so at the end of Inspires. Matt was telling you about it, but it also has the templates for the design status document, for the payload concept proposal, for the PDR briefing, and the CDR briefing. Pull those down. They're in Word, Microsoft Word, and, and PowerPoint. And so we will work with you this semester, but use those as your guide to get through this. And like Matt said, there's other ones out there of previous semesters, so you can see what's a good proposal look like. What is all that about? Okay? So next time, when we actually come and see you in class, this is our only video, uh, if I can get it to move. Um, we need you to create a team email address, right? We need a way to be able to talk to the entire team at one point. So go out on Google, uh, create a Gmail account, create a Yahoo, whatever you want to do. Google's better. Google's better, yeah. But create a, a, an account, an email account, and let us know what it is next week when we come in. Go, our email is blah, blah, blah. So then we can also give that to the UAH contact who will be then be able to work with you. You also need to select or elect the leaders, right? Project manager, chief engineer, communications director, and marketing coordinator. This they, is up to your teacher as well. Yes. How your teacher wants to do this. Yes. So your teacher and you can can discuss that about what you want to do, application, uh, round robin, whatever. I don't know. Uh, it's up to you guys to decide how to do that. But we need you to know who the leaders are next week when we come and in. The teams. Yeah, and the teams. We need to also know what teams are in there. You also, your teachers have a survey packet, right? So we're all working for the government right now, and so. One thing we have to accept is we have to do some paperwork. That's the big thing out of this whole thing. There's paperwork always in government. There's paperwork. No matter state, federal, whatever you're going to do, there's paperwork. So what we need you to do first is have your parents take home this consent form and let them sign it saying that we can ask you some questions. We're not going to ask you things about do you like so-and-so, that kind of stuff. No, we're going to ask you about science. We're going to ask you about math. We're going to ask you about how's your team working, things like that. We're also going to take your picture. That's a big thing for Matt. He yep. likes the pictures. So we're going to take your picture and make it, put it on a little badge for you. It's a pretty little badge you get to keep. It's really cool. So you need to have your parents sign this consent form. And we're also asking them some questions about what about science and math that they like. So if you would take that and do that, that would be cool. There's three surveys we're going to give you guys uh, day one. Actually, you should be getting them today. There's, it's called the, the uh, career interest survey, there's the uh, semantics survey, and then there's a survey for your parents. And uh, so the survey for your parents, they fill that out obviously, and then the other two surveys you fill out if your parents approve. Uh, the two surveys that you fill out, they're each a single sheet of paper, a single side of, of a single sheet of paper, not uh, like, like just a couple of minutes each. And the survey for your parents might take about three or four minutes. So not a lot of time but we, we appreciate your input and your help with this. Also, on all these surveys, we need to make sure you put the ID on it, okay? The ID is in the front of your book. It should say, high school, blah, ID, blah. Blah is filled in with something, mm -hmm. okay? On every survey, everything you fill out for us, we need you to put that ID number on it. We never know who uh, WP7. WP7 is. All we need to know is that WP7 filled this out every time. Your teacher will know who WP7 is, but we never know who that but is. But your teacher never sees the surveys. Right. So we never, we cannot correlate who WP7 is. We just know WP7 answered this, 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 and this on these different surveys. We don't right. know who you are, anything like that. Yeah. So that's the point. The point to all that is we don't to care keep, who you are. Yeah, I'm, anonymity. Mm -hmm. And so you can tell us the truth. If you think you suck one week when we ask you about teaming, put you suck. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing we want. Next thing you're going to do is in your book, in the first section, because we've been talking about all this, is there's a personality test for you. So now you get to figure out A, do you have a personality? And B, what is it? Hopefully. Yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully all of you have personality. So this test is called the Myers Briggs test. And so you can read it and fill it out and you'll find out some stuff. And even in the back it tells you, oh, you, your advantages are this and this and this and your weaknesses are this and this and this. That's cool to know, okay? If you didn't already know that kind of stuff, 
it's pretty neat to know because you don't want carbon copies of yourself in life working together on a team. You each have strengths and weaknesses. And so what's cool is to find out what yours are and what your, your weaknesses are and then go find someone else who compliments you. Mm -hmm. Like us two, we do that really well, don't we, Matt? Yes, we do. <laughs> And, and we compliment each other all the time. I mean, my that coat looks nice. Yes, I'm but just actually compliment today. with an E. Uh, we we have different personalities. We work well together, but we have different personalities. Mine is better, obviously. But um, there's no way. But, but the point is, is yeah, you don't want to have a bunch of carbon copies of the same personality on the team. That way, you know, you you might get one thing done really really well, but all the rest of the stuff's going to fall through the cracks. You want to have different people on the team. It takes different. Uh, people to make a team and so that's what the that's what the personality test is for is just to help you figure out you know where your s spot on the team might be best filled and last but not least review the competition rules and the ICD because in a week or two you will also have a quiz on those that your teacher will, will administer to you so make sure that you look at all this stuff and be ready for next week because we're really excited to be a part of this with you and we hope you are too